Americans often ask, why can't Iran have a secular democratic government? Well, they kind of did. Back in 1951, Iran was a rising nation, starting, uh, you know, a path to democracy. They hate us because they hate us. Or maybe they hate us because we took down their democracy. If they knew about the 1953 U.S. coup because we wanted to keep our hands on the cheap oil. When we went into uh, Iran in 1953 and installed the Shah, yes, there was blowback. Uh, the reaction to that was the taking of our hostages. And it was the US that helped get rid of that government and pave the way for the Ayatollahs and the Islamic Revolution. Iran asked America to help protect their democracy and Britain was like, Ayo America, do you want oil? And America was like, yeah. And what happened? We imposed the Shah, who basically took all the natural resources of Iran and conveniently handed it to the people that the CIA actually worked for, which is not the United States government or the US taxpayers. It's US companies. I mean, that leads to the question, imagine if Americans really knew the history here between the United States and Iran. So the United States and the Islamic Republic of Iran have been on uh, bad terms for roughly the last 43 years. And whenever foreign policy toward the Islamic Republic of Iran is discussed, a lot of political commentators love to bring up Operation Ajax. Often what's played up is this notion that Iran was this free, smoothly operating representative democracy until America with its big bad CIA just waltzed on in and ruined everything. <laughs> In 1896, Nasir al-Din Shah, the monarch who ruled over Iran, was assassinated. According to Stephen Kinzer's book, All the Shah's Men, few people in Iran mourned his death. This was because of the growing discontent toward the Qajar royal family of Iran, who lived rather comfortable luxurious lifestyles off of the backs of Iranians through oppressive taxes and wealth confiscation, as much of the country lived in poverty. When the monarchs could no longer plunder their subjects' wealth, they then turned to selling concessions to other countries and businesses. This trend would not end with the assassination of Nasser. In 1901, after Nasser's son, Musafar, succeeded him to the Peacock throne, he sold a 60-year concession on oil to British financier William Knox Darcy. There was just one problem. Nobody was really certain whether or not Iran had much oil to begin with. Darcy would delegate the responsibility of finding oil to engineer George Reynolds, who spent a good seven years and what would today be 42 million pounds or 50 million dollars trying to find a good oil well to drill from, which was not a simple task in the undeveloped deserts of Iran, which were riddled with stuff like smallpox and warlords. Reynolds and his crew had to build their own roads to travel on, and they were often extorted by nomadic tribes in the region. And aside from one oil well that ran dry after just two months in 1904, Reynolds was struggling to find any worthwhile sources of oil. In the meantime, William Knox Darcy was running dry of cash, eventually turning to the Scotland-based Burma Oil Company for further financing. And by 1908, Burma was losing confidence in the mission, and after clashing with Darcy and Reynolds, Burma sent a letter to Reynolds telling him that they were no longer financing the mission and to shut everything down. As the letter was making its way to Reynolds, which took a pretty long time back in the early 1900s, the crew managed to find the largest source of oil at that time. The discovery was a boon for the Burma Oil Company, who were met with a flood of new investors after their new subsidiary, the Anglo-Persian Oil Company, also known as APOC, 
went public. With all this new money, APOC would go on to construct oil fields, pipelines, and a lot of new infrastructure, as well as a new refinery in Abadan. Now, why is this history important? I think it brings much needed context and details to the subject, notably that it's highly unlikely that anyone in the region would have discovered the vast sources of oil, much less developed the infrastructure necessary to extract and sell it, without greedy businesses looking to make a profit. <laughs> and I think that this notion that politicians get to ignore and violate an agreement and take over a business that just so happens to specialize in natural resources on behalf of people that just happen to live in the region, well, to me, that sounds like blood and soil fascist nonsense, folks. <laughs> It would not take long for the international situation to get complicated. As the British government would become the majority shareholder of APOC by 1913, after Winston Churchill, who at this time was the first Lord of the Admiralty, lobbied to rebuild the Navy with superior oil-powered ships in favor of coal-powered ships. So at this point, we had two countries, the United Kingdom and Iran, as well as a corporation, APOC, three major players, all with an interest in oil in Iran. To make matters more complicated, Iran was still trying to figure itself out politically during this time, it was going through a six-year constitutional revolution between 1905 and 1911, establishing a parliament for the first time, but leaving the monarchy intact with certain responsibilities, notably significant control over the military. But the addition of a parliament was a huge deal given that the monarchy was not exactly acting on the consent of the governed when making big decisions like selling concessions over natural resources. The Qajar dynasty came to an end with the Persian coup of 1921, eventually leading to the establishment of the Pahlavi monarchy under Shah Riza Pahlavi. Is it Pahlavi? Pahlavi? Look, I'm probably going to screw up a lot of these names in this video, so... Excuse me, princess. Eventually leading to the establishment of the Pahlavi monarchy under Shah Riza Pahlavi, who was both unsatisfied with the original Darcy concession and also sought to establish his own authority and position by reducing the power and influence of those who rivaled him including APOC. As a consequence, a new oil concession was negotiated in 1933 that reduced APOC's area by three quarters and increased Iran's royalties to four shillings per ton, as well as 20% of the company's worldwide profits and a minimum of 750,000 pounds, roughly 37 million pounds in today's money, every single year, with the deal being extended from 1961 to 1993. Riza's reign would come to an end during World War II as he would be removed from power by the Allies for supporting the Nazis and exiled in favor of his son, Shah Mohammad Riza Pahlavi. The post-war years became increasingly chaotic as various political factions jockeyed for power and position. But if there was one idea, one trend that united most Iranians, it was hatred for foreign influence, notably the British. More on that later. During the post-World War II years, the government was once again trying to renegotiate a deal with APOC. Prime Minister Ali Razmara had the impossible task of pleasing the popular will of Iranians who wanted a complete takeover of the British oil company, and APOC, who wanted to maintain at least some level of control and profits, and the British government, who was threatening sanctions and retaliation if the company 
was seized. And it appeared that Prime Minister Ali Rizmara was the only candidate capable of brokering a new, more fair deal, so to speak, with the British, which he almost succeeded in doing until it was announced that Saudi Arabia was getting a much better deal with the Americans, which forced Rizmara to withdraw his support for the new agreement. And all hope for a new deal came to an end when Prime Minister Ali Rizmara was assassinated by a member of Fadayeen of Islam, an Islamic fundamentalist organization, who consider themselves on a mission to kill what they consider to be a British stooge. And I think this is a crucial aspect of the story that's never mentioned when talking about Iran or Operation Ajax. A lot of people like to make it sound like Iran was just this well-functioning, smoothly operating democratic system of government. Americans often ask, why can't Iran have a secular democratic government? Well, they kind of did. And that Mohammed Mossadegh won over the hearts and minds of the masses before winning some U.S. style presidential election in a landslide. It's often ignored that Mossadegh's predecessor was assassinated and that it was Parliament who chose Mossadegh to succeed Rasmara as prime minister. And there were a lot of political assassinations and attempts during this period, including an attempt on the young new Shah. Either way, just eight days after the assassination, the parliament voted to nationalize oil throughout Iran, and the following month, Mohammad Mossadegh was chosen by parliament to succeed Ali Rasmara as prime minister. <music> To say that the political climate in post-World War II Iran was polarized would be an understatement. The country had spent much of the 20th century leading up to this point trying to figure out its own identity and how to govern itself. The political factions that dominated Iranian politics were the nationalists in the National Front, the communists in the Today Party, which had ties to the Soviet Union, Islamic fundamentalists led by Ayatollah Kashani, and the Shah and his traditionalist supporters. While these factions certainly had their differences and their clashes, the one thing that seemed to unite them, albeit maybe for different reasons, was contempt for the British. This is why Parliament united behind Mohammad Mossadegh, a 70-year-old lifelong politician whose primary focus was expelling the British, who credited the source of all misfortunes in Iran to the Anglo-Persian oil company. In fact, Mossadegh made it clear that he was motivated primarily by opposition to the British. It was not necessarily about better financial terms for the country. After being appointed prime minister, Mohammad Mossadegh wasted no time dispatching the governor of Khuzestan to APOC now known as the Anglo-Iranian Oil Company's headquarters, to secure the nationalization, which was celebrated with the sacrifice of a sheep. <laughs> well, all right then. Uh, I probably would have went with champagne and confetti, but to each their own. Defenders of Mossadegh today will make it sound like the oil nationalization was a boon for the Iranian economy and the people of Iran, who now got to enjoy all of the riches and the money that the British oil company had enjoyed for decades. <laughs> when actually it was the opposite, as Iran was unable to sell much oil due to a blockade imposed by the British. Exports declined dramatically, which proved devastating for the nation, as the nation relied heavily on their share of the oil profits to fund their government, and much of the economy was dependent on oil revenue. This would not deter Mossadegh, who told Iranians that they should just make sacrifices and and hey, maybe future generations can enjoy some of that sweet oil revenue. What an asshole! 
Meanwhile, the British were unsure how to respond to the oil being seized. On one hand, they recognized that showing weakness may inspire hostility from other countries, one potential being that the Suez Canal might get nationalized next, which ended up happening just a few years later by Egyptian nationalists. On the other hand, the British feared that a military intervention might result in British citizens getting killed or held hostage in Iran. The United States also took great concern with this dilemma as they feared that an invasion could drive Iran into turning toward the Soviet Union. And the United States initially thought that Mossadegh could be worked with as a stalwart against Soviet aggression and influence within the Middle East. Keep in mind that the United States was operating on a foreign policy of containment following World War II, where they sought to contain the spread of communism and Soviet influence throughout the world. And it was not just the United States that wanted to keep the Soviet Union at bay. Many people in Iran were not big fans of the Soviet Union meddling in their affairs, especially after the Soviet Union overstayed their welcome in Azerbaijan following World War II and even considered aiding in a separatist takeover of the region. Anyway, Iran was becoming increasingly chaotic. Mossadegh tried to strip the Shah of his control over the military, and when the Shah refused to relinquish control of the military, Mossadegh resigned, hoping that it would spark backlash toward the Shah, which ended up happening as outraged mobs took to the streets demanding Mossadegh's return. The new prime minister only lasted a few days before Mossadegh was brought back even more powerful than before. And Mossadegh often did stuff like this. He would often use the press to smear his political opponents. Mossadegh would often stir up civil unrest, hoping that mobs and foot soldiers from both the National Front and the Communist Today Party would take to the streets and intimidate on his behalf. Mossadegh was also suspicious of election meddling, at times suspending elections. Elections. And at one point, Mossadegh dissolved parliament entirely to give himself emergency powers before calling for a referendum for a national vote of confidence. As Patrick Clausen and Michael Rubin state in their book Eternal Iran, Mossadegh was ruling like a dictator contrary to his democratic image projected by his supporters years later. Iran was a rising nation, starting, uh, you know, a path to democracy, thanks to a new leader named Mohammad Mossadegh. Okay, you expect me to believe that load of crap? It was very much a Game of Thrones in Iran. At this point, you had three major international powers with an interest in Iran. The British were looking to protect their oil interests. The Soviet Union was looking to expand its influence as it did throughout much of the 20th century. And you had the United States looking to contain the Soviet Union as much as possible. Meanwhile, you had various political factions within Iran from the nationalists in the National Front, the communists in the Today Party, Islamic fundamentalists, and the Shah all jockeying for power. And honestly, I'm not sure if there was a good path forward for Iran at this point, if their options were either nationalism, communism, unchecked monarchy, or an Islamic theocracy. Which is unfortunate because Iran looks like a beautiful country with beautiful people, rich with natural resources and plenty of access to water. It looks like a country with a ton of potential that could be a wonderful, prosperous place if only the nation embraced freedom in the form of a representative democracy established on individual rights. But we know what happened. Operation Ajax happened. With the British being completely expelled from Iran, the Shah reluctantly turned to the United States and the CIA for assistance, worrying that Mossadegh might completely take over the country while the U.S. was worried that the country 
would collapse. The Shah issued a declaration dismissing Mohammad Mossadegh before appointing General Fazlollah Zahidi as the new prime minister before fleeing the country out of fear that shit was going to hit the fan as General Zahidi went into hiding as Mohammad Mossadegh was tipped off about what was going on. And after key members of the military and law enforcement sided with the Shah, General Zahidi held a press conference announcing the dismissal of Mohammed Mossadegh before starting a small pro-Shah demonstration march that grew in numbers toward Tehran as Mohammed Mossadegh fled the city eventually getting arrested. Now, some have blamed CIA propaganda for having an influence on the masses that turned on Mohammed Mossadegh, which definitely played a role, but it also ignores the fact that the Islamic fundamentalists had shifted support toward the Shah and Zahidi at this point. The clerics were never big supporters of Mossadegh in the first place. They only supported Mossadegh for pragmatic reasons, and they had soured on Mossadegh after his his social reforms and his disregard for the constitution and also feared that the destruction of the monarchy would allow for the Soviet Union to take over Iran via the two-day party. This also ignores that the economy had been devastated by this point due to nationalization and the ensuing embargo. Now, I don't say this to launder the reputation of the CIA or U.S. foreign policy, but to frame this whole ordeal as the big bad United States overthrowing a democratically elected leader just so that a few oil companies could make some money. They hate us because they hate us. Or maybe they hate us because we took down their democracy. And what happened? We imposed the Shah, who basically took all the natural resources of Iran and conveniently handed it to the people that the CIA actually worked for, which is not the United States government or the US taxpayers. It's US companies. Is overly simplistic, especially when you consider that Iran actually got to maintain control over the oil. So Operation Ajax ended up overthrowing a nationalist prime minister who nationalized the country's oil and handed control of the country over to the Shah who also maintained control over the oil. In fact, the new consortium that was established ended up having to compensate the still unsatisfied British for the nationalization just to keep both the British and Iran happy. And the Shah was not exactly a good guy. I would say that the Shah definitely governed like a nationalist dictator, increasingly becoming authoritarian as his reign went on. During the Shah's reign, he would eventually ban political parties by establishing a one-party state. And he would deploy Savak, which was the central intelligence agency of the country, to further suppress political opposition and dissidents. There was even one point where the Shah had his own book removed from libraries because his own policies were starting to contradict his previous appeals to freedom. Uh, you absolutely suck! But one positive trend during this time was the fact that Iranians were increasingly becoming educated. Many Iranians during this period were traveling abroad to Western countries for university. However, a consequence of this was students getting influenced by Marxist and socialist intellectuals. You know, bringing back ideas of stuff like class conflict and revolutionary struggle. You know, the sort of ideas that give clueless young people a boner for a revolution. Two major militant political groups ended up forming as a result. The Farayan, which was mostly Marxist, and the MKO, which tried to fuse revolutionary Marxism with Islamamiya. Meanwhile, Ayatollah Ruhollah Khomeini was becoming an increasingly popular figure in Iran, establishing himself as a major opposition force to the Shah despite being exiled following the Ayatollah's public opposition to the Shah's white revolution 
particularly the aspects that gave rights to women. Exile did not stop Khomeini as he would continue to deliver lectures that would be recorded on cassette tapes and smuggled into the country by his followers, allowing Khomeini's ideas and condemnation of the government to spread throughout the country. So between the Marxist students and Ayatollah Khomeini, you had some ugly radical elements brewing eager for a revolution. I think there's this perception that the Shah was a mere puppet of America and corporate interests. How am I gonna get the oil for as cheap as I possibly can? and give it over to ExxonMobil and all the other companies, and I only use them as an example in this case, that are just gonna suck all the resources out of that country. But the Shah often made decisions despite the United States, often to show that he was not some weak pushover. In fact, the Shah would end up using his influence in OPEC to drive up oil prices for the sake of bringing in more revenue for the country, mostly to fund the Shah's generous public works and infrastructure projects. We're talking public investment in schools, roads, bridges, hospitals, and a bunch of other cool stuff in hopes of expanding the Iranian economy. And for a while, the economy in Iran was booming and prospering. And this was really the only thing that the Shah had going for him. The bad news is that the booming economy was unsustainable because... Well, government economic planning just does not work, folks. <laughs> Even when the oil revenues were hot, a lot of money was going to waste, and just as the economy was overheating, the demand for oil fell because a lot of Western countries were going into a recession. The government tried to make up for the lost oil revenue by just printing money, which just led to inflation, which just made things even worse. Meanwhile, the government tried to blame inflation on price gouging and greedy businesses, Gee, where have we heard that one before? It was so bad that a lot of merchants and businesses were often prosecuted and harassed. So with the economy in the tank, the Shah lost whatever support amongst the masses that he had left. Add to that the discontent throughout the country due to the Shah being perceived as oppressive, corrupt and out of touch. Now the Marxist radicals and the Islamic fundamentalists had a perfect opportunity to cash in for a revolution. I think the thing that really set Ayatollah Khomeini apart from everyone else in the revolution was that he was a firm believer in his worldview. He was consistent, clear, and uncompromising with his message and ideas. And he knew exactly what he wanted, which was to establish a government based on Islamomia. I'm not even sure if Khomeini wanted power for the sake of power and prestige. He just genuinely believed that it was necessary to establish a country based on Islamic law, governed by clerics and religious scholars until the hidden imam from the 9th century reemerges after hiding for a thousand years or some goofy-ass nonsense. Sort of reminds me of the High Sparrow from Game of Thrones, who uh, was just this kooky religious guy with a... Uh, with a battalion of militants at his disposal that Cersei Lannister thought she could use and work with to uh, strengthen her grip over King's Landing. Underestimating the High Sparrow and his uncompromising beliefs to the point where she eventually found herself locked in one of his dungeons. Anyway, the Marxist radicals and the moderate liberals who played a major role in the revolution also thought that they could work with Ayatollah Khomeini. They thought that they could use the Ayatollah as a figurehead to really unite the Iranians against the Shah. And that once the Shah was out of the picture, that all of the major players and thinkers of the revolution could all come together and sit down and uh, redraft a constitution. And little did these Marxist revolutionaries and moderate liberals know that it was 
actually the Ayatollah and the clerics that were playing them. In January of 1979, the Shah left Iran for good. Soon after that, Ayatollah Khomeini triumphantly returned to the country, and then the country fell into chaos with a neutral military and weak provisional government. Ayatollah Khomeini, knowing that the Marxist revolutionaries had no shortage of foot soldiers and muscle on the ground through groups like the MKO and Fadayan, immediately looked for ball busters of his own. Through groups like the Mujahideen of the Islamic Republic, the Islamic Revolutionary Guard, and Hezbollah, who were used to not only match the muscle of rival factions within the revolution, but also to enforce what they saw as justice on enemies of the revolution, and just terrorize and intimidate people in general. Meanwhile, politically, the clerics were running circles around the Marxists and the liberals, setting the terms of the March referendum by simply asking the question, do you support replacing the Shah with an Islamic Republic, yes or no. Given that most of the country at this point had turned on the Shah, 98% of the votes came back yes. Then came the new constitution. A draft was brought forward in June of 1979, which I guess Ayatollah Khomeini was willing to sign so long as it added a provision that prohibited women from holding political office. Meanwhile, the Marxist revolutionaries and the liberals, they were thinking maybe it's not a good idea to rush this new constitution. They were thinking, hey, we're all about democracy and the will of the people could never be wrong. Maybe we should hold elections so that the people can choose representatives for a constitutional assembly to redraft a constitution, which, ended up backfiring when the elections were dominated by Islamic fundamentalists, thanks in part to intimidation tactics from the Islamic Republican Party. After the election results came in, Ayatollah Khomeini took it a step further, saying that the Constitution should be won 100% Islamic, and that non-clerics lack the qualifications to chime in on what should be in the Constitution and uh, should not be involved in writing a new Constitution. Ayatollah Khomeini ended up getting the Islamic government and Constitution that he wanted, and many of the Marxist and liberal revolutionaries that helped lay the ground for the revolution and worked with the Ayatollah suddenly found themselves being suppressed by the Ayatollah's new regime. The clerical regime in Iran has been oppressing its citizens for roughly four decades at this point, which alone is horrific enough, but the clerical regime also has taken great interest in exporting its revolution abroad. It was even established in the new constitution following the revolution, and it did not take long for Ayatollah Khomeini and his regime to seek exporting the revolution. From invading Iraq, even after Saddam Hussein's forces were repelled from Iraq, Iran, with some insisting that a reason for this was to establish a Shia Islamic regime in Iraq, to using Hezbollah to expand Iran's influence into countries like Lebanon, to funding and sponsoring a variety of terrorist organizations over the years. But often, whenever foreign policy toward Iran is discussed, the who's who of blame America first dorks like to bring up Operation Ajax as if it's relevant. But for the sake of argument, let's just concede the point that it was a mistake for the United States to assist the Shah in overthrowing Mohammed Mossadegh. You know what? Let's just agree that it's bad for countries to meddle in the affairs of other countries. Okay, then why is it then okay for the Islamic theocratic regime that is currently 
ruling Iran to do the same thing to other countries? You know, that's a really good question. Should we just brush off Hezbollah's influence in places like Lebanon and their terrorist attacks, including against Americans? Because, hey, Operation Ajax. Should we ignore Iran's funding and sponsoring of terrorist organizations? Because, hey, Operation Ajax. Should we just tolerate a hostile Islamic theocratic regime developing nuclear weapons when they have a clear ambition to export its shitty ass revolution? Because, hey, Operation Ajax. I mean, what's it going to take for these knuckleheads to retire this stupid talking point? Is it going to take a mushroom cloud outside of Jerusalem? Now that's fucked up. Again, the point of all of this is not to defend, excuse, or even make apologies for United States foreign policy. The U.S. has a long history of foreign policy mistakes, blunders and dumb strategies that are well worthy of scrutiny. But it is also foolish to talk as if Iran was governed by some stable, smoothly operating representative democracy in 1952 before the big bad CIA just waltzed on in and ruined everything just so that a few oil companies can make a few extra dollars. But even if that was the case, the fact that the United States may have made a foreign policy error roughly 70 years ago is not reason enough to just tolerate a hostile theocratic regime. <laughs>